Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for attending this webcast on mental health during the pandemic presented by Nature Careers. Um, it's a topic we've wanted to do for a while um, in these this sort of webcast forms. So we're very pleased that we can um, we can give it to you now. Um, first of all, hi, my name's Jack. I'm one of the editors here at Nature Careers and I'll be moderating the session and talking you through um, how this is all going to work. Um, just after this little pre-recorded message, you're going to hear from Ellen Warens. Um, she's going to be talking about her lab's happiness program um, during the pandemic and how how they've all learned to support each other and look after each other um, in this difficult time. After Ellen, we'll go straight to Daphne Ling. Daphne's going to talk about the culture of academia and why perhaps the sort of always on productivity culture that we have is perhaps not the best thing to be uh, to be focused on during the pandemic. Uh, and then from Daphne, we'll go straight to Luana Marquez. Um, she's going to give us some practical help and advice in terms of managing your mental health and looking after yourself during um, this difficult time. Um, so the three of them together, that should last around half an hour and should be an interesting mix of health and advice and personal stories. Um, after we hear from them, we're going to move into a live question and answer session with the speakers. Um, if you do have a question at any point during this, please do feel free to type it in. Uh, there should be a box somewhere on the web page where you're watching that says, ask a question. Um, just type it in, it will come straight to me and I'll, um, I'll ask uh, Ellen, Daphne and Luana those questions as they come in. Uh, so thank you very much. Thanks for coming. And uh, yeah, we look forward to, to seeing your questions and I hope you enjoy. Thanks. Hello everyone, my name is Ellen Werens and I work as a scientific writer in the RIAS group and we are a research group focusing on advanced imaging technologies and we're at the Princess Maxima Center for Pediatric Oncology in the Netherlands. So today I think you will be hearing from both Daphne and Luana about the stresses the current pandemic can cause at a personal level and how to best handle those. So I'm going to be focusing on the team perspective instead basically showing you what we are doing to stay connected as a team while being socially distanced um, during the pandemic. And our strategy came about during a lab happiness program that's, that we recently run. So we're going to give you a short recap of this program and share with you the tools that became most valuable to us and how we are now implementing those during the work from home mandate. So maybe I should also give you a quick introduction why we initiated a lab happiness program in the first place, because I don't think that's something typically done. As I'm sure you all are too, we are very passionate about the work that we do. So we always like to say that we have our hearts in science as well. And therefore we think in order to be truly creative and innovative, we also need to take care of our hearts and our feelings a little bit. So we didn't leave matters to chance here and we sought professional guidance from Hermann Boss or Happy Coach as we like to call him, who designed a program for us tailored to ensure a happy and balanced work environment. And this program started off by taking quite an extensive questionnaire. We answered over 200 questions online that were um, based on the big five personality model. And this was helpful in two ways. First of all, we learned about our own personalities and once you know your personality, it means that you can also act out of character at times. For instance, if you are, say, an outspoken person, sometimes you can also maybe choose to deliberately tone it down in meetings a bit so there's a chance for other people to speak up as well. And we think this is important because it creates an open space where there's room for everybody and the team to offer their ideas, opinions and criticism. Second of all, and I think even more important, we learned a whole lot about each other's personalities and, think, and we think that this is helping us now to work better together. And this can be very simple. For instance, when we were still allowed to go into work, we reserved the more quiet spots in our kind of open and noisy big office space for the more introverted personalities in our team. But also we try to design everybody's role in the team so that it matches their specific personality and qualities. And we think that this all allows us to work more efficiently, but also more happy together. And now during the pandemic, this information became very useful as well because it made us um, realize and acknowledge and accept that everybody will react different to the situation based on their personality. 
So for instance, for the more introverted people like myself, we might not mind working from home as much because it means less distractions. Whereas more outgoing people, they can struggle a bit with not having daily interaction with colleagues. So in the Netherlands, we've been very lucky. We've always been allowed to go outside for activities as long as we maintain a safe distance from each other. So one thing, for instance, that my PI implemented is that she would go on bike ride meetings. So this serves two purposes. There's a real um, personal connection, even though it's from a distance, but it's not virtual. And also there's, of course, exercise involved. And you will be hearing from Luana how about staying fit and having exercise is very important when dealing with stressful situations. Another thing that we implemented are our so-called iceberg meetings. So there's no specific structure to these meetings, but what they're all about is the things you don't see on the surface. So the motivations, perceptions, expectations, and feelings during our behavior. So when an iceberg meeting is called in, it's clear for everybody involved that we are supposed to let go of any assumptions we might have based on what we see in this, on the surface, and instead openly ask and discuss about what's really going on underneath. And again, this is also a very healthy mindset when it comes to think about how your colleagues might react to the current situation. So we already talked about the personality that might influence their behavior and reaction in the current um, pandemic situation. And for us, it became very clear that there's a big difference between introverted versus extroverted personalities, how they experience working from home. But also your situation at home, um, for instance, whether you are trying to work from home while also taking care of small children, or quite the opposite, whether you are living uh, mostly by yourself and thereby may experience a higher level of social isolation. True for a lot of members in our team, whether you have friends and family abroad with no outlook when you will be able to travel again and see them in person. And of course, also the phase and type of project that you're working on and how heavily it's dependent on lab work and your physical presence within the Institute. Then I would like to end on what I, and I think this view is shared by most of my members in the team, consider our most effective and valuable tool. And that's our happiness color code sharing system. So what this is, is that we start a general round in a lab meeting by um, stating a color that we are that reflects our overall happiness level at that moment. So green means you're doing great, everything is going well, yellow somewhere in between, and red means you're not doing well at all. And this is very helpful in two ways. First of all, by knowing each other's well-being, we can account for it. So for instance, if somebody is in the red, we can keep expectations a little bit lower that week, giving them time and air to come back to green. But also we will try to reach out and see if we can be helpful in some way. And this is also why we implemented our body system. So these are two members of the team that kind of partner up and take special notice and responsibility towards each other's happiness level. So if you're in the red, you might very well receive an invitation from your body for coffee. And even though it's a coffee, a virtual coffee date at the moment, given the circumstances that can still be very helpful. Also, we think the system sends across a very clear and important message. You are not invisible and your well-being matters to all of us. And together with our iceberg meetings, where we might discuss more controversial topics, that helps to create a very open and space atmosphere where we can talk about anything. During the pandemic, the scholar coding system has been very helpful as well, not only to keep track on how people were doing at an individual level, but also to signal the group's overall sentiment. And I think halfway through the pandemic, when we noticed that more and more members were getting red, we kind of tried to break that downward spiral by hosting an informal get together on Zoom. So just chat, no work related topics. And you can see here, we have some relaxing backgrounds going on. There's people having a drink. And we even managed to call in with an alpaca and llama farm. And for us, this was very excited because exciting because we consider llama our spiritual animal because some of our most useful or widely used antibodies that we use in our imaging are llama originated. And also now more than ever, we try to celebrate every achievement and occasion. So for instance, when we submit a paper, even though we know we're submitting a paper is still a very far away from actually publishing it, 
we mark this moment together. So we get to gather on Skype with everybody that was involved in finalizing the paper and then we hit the submit button together. And then we take a screenshot of that moment as you can see here and we share it within the team. And also birthdays, although socially distanced, people still um, send pictures around of how they're celebrating their birthdays at home and we even managed to do socially distanced safe birthday gift drop-offs as you can see. And finally, one last thing I would like to share with you is our exercise photo contest that we initiated immediately after the lockdown became effective. And you can even see Happy Coach um, participating in this one. And again, this serves two purposes. It offers a way to stay connected because we share um, with the team what we are doing at home to stay fit, but also it encourages people to stay active. And again, you will hear from Luana today how important that is. So we have now started to slowly scale up, scale up to going back to work at the Institute, but only with a maximum number of people allowed per day. And also we still have to maintain the safe distance from each other. But I think the tools that we've learned and implemented will uh, remain valuable even when we resume work um, back as normal. I hope some of these tools can be valuable to you as well. Um, you can read more about it in the Nature Career columns that we have on this topic. Feel free to also find me on LinkedIn or reach out personally by email. And of course, I will be happy to um, answer any questions that might have come up during the Q&A session later. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Ellen, for that talk. Uh, we're now going to move on to Daphne's talk around um, productivity in academia. Again, if you do have a question at any point, please do feel free to type it in. Um, there should be a space somewhere on this web page where you can do that. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Daphne Ling and I'm a PhD student in neuroscience at the University of British Columbia in Canada. And for my PhD, I'm specializing in executive functions and prefrontal cortex, and I primarily work with children with ADHD. Now before I go on, I'm just going to very briefly run through what executive functions are. And essentially, they are a set of cognitive processes that are important when going on automatic is no longer sufficient or advisable. And executive functions allow us to you know, exercise self-control and to think before we act. It, uh, the, it allows us to pay attention and to concentrate and to tune out distractive stimuli. Uh, we need them uh, to start a task and to complete that task. And executive functions are also very important for us to be able to problem solve, to reason, to hold a conversation, and to adapt to novel situations. These skills, they are dependent on a network of brain regions the most prominent of which is prefrontal cortex. Now, if you think about it, as scientists and researchers, we actually use our executive functions extensively in our work. You know, we design experiments, we build models, we analyze data and we interpret the data. We situate that data in um, the current context and how it relates to previous findings and also how our current findings uh, contribute to new knowledge. We present that data and those findings to fellow researchers, to grant reviewers and our papers. We respond to reviewer three. Uh, and now more than ever, we communicate our findings to the public and we discuss how we can shape public policy. Now the thing is, working from home, our executive functions are also taxed in very novel ways. So the easiest example that I can think of is that many of us suddenly found ourselves going from teaching in person to teaching online. And some of this was just overnight. We're also supporting students with different kinds of trauma in very different time zones. And for many of us, we also found ourselves caring for children, uh, with caring for our partners, caring, caring for aging parents, and also family members with disabilities. And we didn't have access to childcare. We didn't have access to nannies. We didn't have access to in-home so, uh, so, uh, support from healthcare professionals. And that was really, really hard. That is very, very hard. For many of us, we also found that we didn't have a home office that we could actually work in. And we also didn't have access to our peers and colleagues. I mean, we could no longer just walk down the hall, you know, cross over to the other side and say, I'm having trouble with something, could you please help me? 
And sheltering in place and staying at home also came with a whole host of other challenges, some of which I've already mentioned. Um, and one of the most prominent was social isolation, especially if you're living alone. We didn't have contact with people, and that led to a lot of stress and anxiety. Now, the thing I wanted to highlight about prefrontal cortex and executive functions, um, it's that it's, they are highly susceptible to stress. They are the first to suffer when we're stressed out, and they suffer the most. And they, you know, executive functions suffer when we're tired, when we're sleep deprived, we're sad, we're scared, we're lonely, we're socially isolated, we're worried, we're you know, anxious, and we're in poor health. Now, in short, that is everything that this pandemic has thrown at us. Many of us are struggling to find the motivation to work right now. And when we are able to sit down and say, hey, we're going to work, we're finding that it's, you know, it's suddenly very difficult to do the things that we previously found so very easy. And that is actually normal. Yet, we are expecting ourselves to keep working and being productive as if this was business as usual. Well, newsflash, there is absolutely nothing normal or business as usual uh, about a pandemic. The world is burning right now. Nothing is normal about it, and it is not a sabbatical. But many of us are trying to work as if it is. I mean, some of you have probably seen this joke going around the internet. In fact, I think many of you have seen this joke. And for me, it's like, absolutely no. This is not the kind of standard. This is not the expectation that we should be putting on everybody. Now, I'm going to tell you a little story about what I've been going through for the past four months. It's really short. So I'm a PhD student, graduate student. I live on campus, uh, student residence. And my accommodation, my residence is what's known as a graduate residence. So all the students there, uh, we're all some kind of trainee. And it's either graduate school itself or med school or law school. Um, and what happened was when classes transitioned online and we had to do this shelter in place thing, our residents basically shut down our uh, in-person dining meal service. They also cut off our access to our stoves and our ovens, and they also shut down our common living spaces, so our reading rooms, our study rooms. And all of a sudden, all oh, this whole bunch of grad students, like a hundred of us, were stuck at home in our little rooms because we also couldn't go to our labs or offices or to the libraries. And we all had to live in such close quarters. And it was very, very stressful. In fact, it still is very, very stressful. And I am still beating myself up. I've been beating myself for four months and I'm still beating myself up currently for being completely unproductive. And I am somebody who is working with executive functions and prefrontal cortex. I'm able to tell you why I am not able to work properly and how there is a neurobiological reason behind it. But knowing it intellectually is very different from actually living it, right? And I am just beating myself up over this. And I wanted to say, it is okay to say you're not okay. It is, there's nothing shameful or weak about saying, hey, I'm struggling and I'm not okay. And I think now more than ever, it's very important for us to be able to normalize this, to be able to say this. So I'm going to share very briefly what I've been doing for my mental health. Um, it might not work for you because there's no one size fits all. But if it does, then great. I think the most important thing for me that I have learned is saying no, being able to say no and not feeling guilty about it. So for example, I might get five invites for a Zoom hangout of some sort, whether it's Zoom happy hour or um, you know, a live streaming of whatever movie. I found that what helped me a lot was being able to say, no, I don't feel like being there or I don't have the mental space to be able to do that right now. And it is okay to be able to say that. 
Um, I also stayed connected with my family and friends through social media a lot. And I, it's very cliche, but I found that carving out some time every day to do a little bit of exercise, even if it's just walking around my residence, was very helpful. And to also to try and eat as balanced a diet as possible, which was really hard because I didn't have a stove or an oven. But I tried to do these things. And you have to do what's right for you. Because what works for me won't necessarily work for you. Which means if you're finding that working and churning out papers, it's what's getting you through your days and your weeks and your months, then you do that because it works for you. But if it doesn't work for you, if you're like me and you're struggling to be able to do that, then it is okay as well. If what works for you is reading for half an hour, binging of four hours on Netflix, reading for another half an hour, and then spending four hours gazing at the ceiling, that's okay. Because you need to do what's right for you. Now, Ellen before me, she gave a presentation about the her lab happiness program, and she outlined very specific steps that you can do if you want to implement this in your own little group. Luana, who's going to be talking after, uh, who's going to be speaking after me, she's going to present on how we can take care of our mental health and also the mental health of the people around us and why it is very important. And I think that together, all of these strategies that are being shared, um, hopefully, you know, it will be helpful to some of you. I also wanted you to know that all your struggles and your anxieties and your fears and your concerns, all of them, your tears, they are real. They are valid. And it is okay for you to acknowledge that. And the very sad thing is that we don't all have access to the same resources or the support networks. And so our struggles look very different. And I wanted to say also, I wanted to acknowledge rather that, you know, the reality of the world right now is such that the more systems of oppression that you identify with, the bigger your struggles, the larger your roadblocks, and the heavier the burden that you have to bear. And I'm very sorry because this is definitely going to contribute to your stress. And it sucks. And before I end, I wanted to just say this to people who are administrators, as well as people who are, you know, in positions of privilege or power in some way, shape or form. I ask that you pay very special attention and that you keep it very clearly in your head that people, as they come back to campuses, as we reopen, slowly reopen, they're going to be bringing with them different kinds of trauma. They're going to be bringing with them inequalities and inequities in their life. And this is going to impact their work. And this is something that we need to address. And that if you are an administrator or a person who's, who's got privilege and power, I ask that you build this into everything that you're doing, especially your evaluations. So whether it's you know, hiring for a job, whether it's an annual progress report, or it's an evaluation for a grant, a scholarship, a fellowship, for merit reviews, or tenure and promotion, I ask that you be very, very cognizant of this. Because if you don't, we are going to be hemorrhaging even more talent than we are already hemorrhaging right now. And that is not the kind of place that is helpful to anybody. So I ask that you really pay attention to that and to do something about it. And with that, stay safe, stay well, take care, and I hope you're as okay as you possibly can be right now. Thank you. Thank you, Daphne. We're now gonna to go to Luana, who's gonna offer some help and advice on how to manage your mental health during the pandemic. If you have any questions for Luana or any of our other speakers, please do feel free to type in a question um, in the, the questions box and we'll get to it as soon as Luana's talk finishes. Hi, I'm Dr. Luana Matthews. I'm a clinical psychologist at Mass General Hospital 
associate professor at Harvard Medical School and the president of the Anxiety and Depression Association of America. I'm delighted to speak to you today about emotions related to COVID-19. First, I want to remind all of us that during these challenging times, sometimes it's okay not to be okay. And this is why. All of us are facing a real threat, the pandemic related to COVID-19. In addition to this threat, we are also facing some additional threats, such as insecurities in food, shelter, work, and racism. Our body is biologically wired to protect us from threats, and upon perceiving a threat, immediately activates our limbic system, the emotional part of our brain. Immediately, you feel your heart pounding faster, you tensing up, you're ready to fight, fight, or flight. I like to think about the fight or flight response that our body is biologically designed to do through the lenses of the Yeeks Dobson Law. What we know is that low levels of arousal, there's still also low levels of performance. Think about this as waking up in the morning, feeling a little sluggish, feeling like your brain's not 100% there for you. At moderate levels of arousal, we actually have peak performance. This is often described as being in the zone, in a flow state, when your brain feels like it's flowing, can really focus. However, as the stress related to COVID-19 moved from acute for weeks to months, it's become a chronic stress, and our body is currently often in a state of fight or flight, leading us to a moment being in the red where too much arousal actually affects our performance. You may have experienced this in your work life when you might be having trouble focusing. You're finding it hard to engage your brain. That's consistent what we know of data coming out in the U.S. and globally. In the U.S., we know that about one-third percent of American adults are reporting clinical anxiety, clinical signs of anxiety and depression. When we look at cross-sex surveys in the world, in Spain, increase in depression and anxiety, similar results in India where 80% perceived mental health needs. When we look at Ethiopia, 25.0% of individuals reporting psychological distress. What we're seeing here is an uptick in mental health needs and increase in distress related to COVID-19. This is similar to data coming out of China early on, where a cross-sectional survey across 34 different hospitals illustrate that first responders had significant increase in the stress, depression, anxiety, and insomnia. Let's think about this in context more globally and in past disasters. Let's think about the mental health wave. Well, what we know from the SARS outbreaks is that 64% of individuals a year after the outbreak reported potentially likely psychiatric symptoms. Another point of data, if you look at September 11 in the US, 11 to 13 years after 9-11, 10% of responders still met a diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder. Let's put that in the context of the US currently. We know there's approximately 18 million first responders. That could mean that 10 years from now, we still have 1.8 million individuals needing mental health care. So what can we do? What can we do to decrease this mental health, potential mental health wave? Well, we need to actually activate a different part of our brain. We need to turn on our prefrontal cortex, the part of our brain that helps us to plan, to organize, to make good decisions. And what we know scientifically is by turning on the prefrontal cortex, we're actually able to decrease that limbic fight or flight response. So how do we do that? Well, in our lab here at Mass General, we rely on the principles of cognitive behavior therapy, which is a short-term evidence-driven kind of therapy that is designed to help across many different types of mental health disorders. And what we know is the principles of CBT when compared in randomized control trial tend to show significant response with 38 to 82% of individuals actually responding to, well to CBT. The nice thing about cognitive behavior therapy is that not only helps with your brain health, but it also helps with your immune system, with data demonstrating that it can boost your immune system. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, are you suggesting that we all become therapists? Absolutely not. I think that we all need to think about skills to cool off our brain. How do we take what we know for cognitive behavior therapy, focus on skills, not therapy? And how can each one of us sitting at home and at work be able to cool off our brain? And there are four skills that I want to share with you today. 
Let's start about being of service. Why is it so important to be of service? Besides the fact that it makes you feel better, we know that it decreases signs of depression and increase happiness. Many of us in the medical field are currently being of service. And you can think about this in many ways as giving an opportunity to give dosage of being of service. How can you, in this moment, help your fellow colleagues, your family, your loved ones to activate their prefrontal cortex and deem their limit system so that we can really be of service? I can assure you that this definitely is not only scientifically sound, but I myself have found it very helpful to be there and provide service to those that need in this moment and certainly is protective to my emotional health. Second skill that I think is extremely important is this idea of unplugging for social media and the television and the news. And this is why. What we know from research here in Boston after the marathon bombings is that individuals that watch six plus hours of news daily had significantly more distress related to the bombings than individuals that compared to those that are actually there. So sitting home and actually watching the news on and on again is actually activating your limbic system. So it's really important for us to try as much as we can to unplug. And we need to really anchor on something else. So the first thing is to figure out how you're going to, how often you're going to watch the news. Here, I recommend the WHO guidelines of perhaps once or twice a day. What I recommend that to most of my patients as well is that maybe perhaps anchoring on how you did it before the pandemic. If you watch the news only in the evening, trying to go back to your previous news consumption to help to cool off your brain. But because all of our brains have lots of uncertainty right now. It may still feel a little activated. So it's important to then anchor in something that's good for you. For example, going for a walk, drinking a cup of tea, things that allow you to cool off your brain, playing with your kids, things that really feel good in that moment so that you're not sitting and wondering in, in uncertainty. The next skill that's extremely important is to think about charging up. This is what I mean. Our bodies, our physical bodies, are very similar to our cars. We actually have to spend energy to get energy. So we have to drive our cars to be able to recharge our batteries. And sometimes when you're feeling extra stressful or you're in the red in the UX Dobson, it really doesn't feel good to do things. But it's important to remember that if you start doing things, you actually will feel better. And the three domains that I often think when I think about charging up is eating, sleep, and exercise. Now, all of us have heard the value of eating, sleeping, and exercise. But right now, I want to urge you to think about this as preventive measures to help bring your own wave of emotional challenges related to COVID. Focusing on eating regularly, making sure that you're eating as healthy as you possibly can. Making sure that you're practicing good sleep hygiene, trying to go to bed at a certain time, wake up at the same time, minimize news consumption, and also making sure you're moving your body. Perhaps you can't access the gym, you can't really exercise the way you want it, but anything, getting up and dancing, doing anything that actually helps to move your body with the idea that we need to spend energy to get energy. Next, I want to talk about staying connected. Now, with Zoom and, and through webinars like this, many of us are finding creative ways to be connected. But what's important to remember is staying connected is decreased depression and anxiety and increased life satisfaction, even through social media. So this research just shows that uh, through Facebook, you still can decrease depression and anxiety. All of us, of course, wish we could be our loved ones, but we know the social connection is one of the few buffers we have against emotional difficulties. So I urge us all to stay connected in, possible, in many ways. Um, here we have an example of being able to talk through a window, making sure that you join perhaps an online book club um, so that you are not so isolated, that you're finding ways to connect with others. And I urge us all to remember to also connect with our elderly who might be alone and need some support. So today we talked about this idea that our bodies are biologically wired to have a fight or flight response, that we are, that anxiety is normal and adaptive up to a point, and that our job is to be able to figure out how to turn on our prefrontal cortex as a means to perhaps deem our limbic system. We talked through four sets of skill, being of service and helping others, 
unplugging for the news and increasing something good for you. Charging app, focusing on eating, sleeping, and exercise to get your body moving so that you feel better. And staying connected as a way to buffer difficulties related to emotional health. I wanted to finally end by sharing some resources with you. We created a series of webinars through Harvard Health Publishing that you can go on and get a deep dive on each of those skills. On July 15th, we'll be launching a mental health for our course that's also going to be free and available globally. And you can also access both the mental health for all and the global resources through my website at www drluana.com. I want to finish by thanking my amazing team, MS General, who um, supports all of our research endeavors. And thank each one of you for watching today and being part of our webinar series. I look forward to connecting with you and sharing our thoughts. Thank you. Thank you so much to all of our speakers um, for those talks. Uh, we're now going to go into our live question and answer session. If you do have a question, please do feel free to type in your, your question in that box there um, and we will try to get to as many as we can. Thank you. Hi everyone, uh, thank you so much for uh, coming back to us um, and we are now into the live session of our, uh, of our webcast. I'm here with uh, Luana, Daphne and Ellen. I hope you can all see and hear us okay. Um, we're going to run through a few of your questions that have come in during the Q&A. Um, if you do have a question for us, um, please do drop it in. There should be a box somewhere around on this webpage. If you've got any questions for us, do stick them in and we'll get to them um, as soon as we can. We've, we've had a few through whilst we've been through the pre-recorded sessions. Um, I'm going to start us off with um, quite a specific one, um, just because Ellen, we haven't heard from you in a while. Um, someone's asked after sort of some more specifics around your happiness color scheme. And I just wondered if you could, um, you could share how you, how you share your color scheme um, and, and, how that sort of feeds into your personal and professional life. So how much do you use your color scheme to represent both your professional and personal life? Or is it just about work? Is it just about your personal life? Um, and, and how, you know, practically do you do that? Thank you. Yeah, of course, sure. So um, first of all, we share this in our general round that we have in our weekly lab meeting. So that gives us like kind of a snapshot about how everybody is doing in that moment. And that's also why it's both personal life and work life, I would say. So you don't have to share why you are a certain color and it can be because of work related issues, but it can also be personal events in your life. But it's just for us to get a sense of how you're doing overall. And that means if you're not doing so well, um, like I said, we can account for it and also take action towards it. But if somebody from the team is reaching out and say, hey, I notice you're doing that well, you wanna talk about it and you don't want to, of course, that's also totally fine and we respect that. But we just try to help a little bit where we can. And sometimes that can be as easy as just try to minimize load work a bit for that week or as long as you need. Thank you. And, and are you sort of hold, holding up something in a, in a meeting or typing it in? No, we just say the color. How's I it, have to say work? there's also reason for some of our team members to be crazy colors like cyan, but it should be very simple and it should be just green, yellow and red. Um, but yeah, sometimes people get away with it a little bit. Great. Thank you very much. Um, great. Well, that, that leads me on to my next question quite neatly, actually. Um, someone's asked around recognizing whether or not you're okay. Um, so I think often uh, when you talk about mental health, there, there's this sort of assumption that you immediately know what your personal mental state is, which isn't necessarily always the case. Um, Luana, can I start with you? How do, how, does, how do you recognize your own mental state? How do you start thinking about sort of watching yourself and your, and your health? 
So I'd recommend that you check in on three domains, which in our lab here at Mass General, we call the TAB, Thoughts, Emotions, and Behavior Cycle. So really taking a little time to notice what you're saying to yourself, how those thoughts are affecting what you're doing and your, how you're feeling. And so, for example, you know, if you wake up and, and you notice that you're saying things like, I'm not going to be able to submit that paper today. Um, that thought in itself might create a lot of anxiety, which may get you paralyzed. And so really sort of taking a break to examine how you're feeling, taking a little downtime to do that. And if you notice that your thoughts are spinning a bit, that you're finding yourself stuck, um, that you're saying things like never, always, um, tending to catastrophize, that's the time to really figure out what kind of help you need. Um, but that's the first thing I'd notice is really thoughts, emotions, and behaviors. Um, and I would check in daily with yourself. And is there any sort of practical um, way to check in with yourself? You know, how would you recommend doing that um, specifically? I, I've heard, you know, a mental health diary might be helpful or taking 10 minutes out of the day to just think about your own mental health. You know, is there anything you'd specifically recommend? So um, I, I would, a journal does help. So in the evening, it could also help with sleep, sort of being, sitting down and writing what you're feeling, what your thoughts are. Um, I think if you're concerned about your emotional health, also taking some measures, like for example, the Anxiety and Depression Association of America has questionnaires that you can take. They'll help you figure out if your anxiety or stress or sadness is a little too much. Um, but practically, one, a journal would help. I think writing down thoughts, emotions, and behaviors and observing what's happening will help. Um, and then if you're concerned, then taking a evidence-based measure to get a sense of where your stress or depression is. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm, uh, I'm gonna move on to the next question. Um, this one is, uh, touches on a webcast we did uh, earlier in this sort of series of webcasts, which is around staying motivated um, during coronavirus. D Daphne, just because we haven't heard from you so far, I mean, well, I wonder if you had any particular advice for staying motivated um, well, as we're all working from home and, you know, stressed and um, potentially finding things difficult. Oh, Daphne, I'm afraid we... I don't think staying, we can hear staying. you. Staying motivated would be dependent on the person. There we go. Uh, you can hear me now, right? Yeah. Yes. Um, and I think, I think it ties into what uh, Luana was saying, that you first need to have that understanding of what motivates you. Uh, so writing it down does help. Uh, and then from there, um, working from it. So for me, I know I get motivated when I have chocolate. So I've identified that and I reward myself with chocolate. Um, the thing is, it's not going to work for everybody. And um, yeah, that one takes working on. So you have to identify what motivates you. And then, yeah. So, so, so getting to know yourself, I suppose. Um, I, I will, I, I'll take the opportunity to plug um, some articles on nature.com slash careers as well while we're here. Um, there's a few excellent articles from authors, um, some of who have appeared in previous webcasts around um, staying motivated during coronavirus. So if, if anyone's interested in those, uh, please go to nature.com slash careers and you'll be able to find some articles there, but um, you know, specifically around staying motivated. Uh, I'm going to move on now. Um, I uh, one of the things we were discussing before we we went to this live Q and A is is sort of specific coping strategies when things get bad um, when your mental health your mental state is you know acutely stressed or difficult. Um, Luana, do you mind if I start with you? So would you would you recommend any really specific coping strategies uh, when your mental health is in particular distress? If that's right, thank you. Jack, um, the things that I use that has been helping me is what in our lab we call charge up. And so really focusing as much as you can on eating often and ideally healthy um, so that your body and your brain has enough um, to keep going. Um, 
exercise, so moving often. And I think one of the tricks that I've been doing lately is trying to like put books up and so stand if I'm in a Zoom call and be able to move a little bit. So exercise, not just like physical exercise, but moving as much as you can. Um, and then sleep. And I know sleep has been a struggle for me. And I think many individuals during this pandemic, especially when we are on all the time doing amazing things like this webinar, but we're still connected a lot. And so I go back to sleepy hygiene. So trying to unplug from um, as much as you can, at least two hours before going to bed. If you're laying in bed for at least 20 minutes, getting up, and I mentioned, I think you mentioned as well, Jack, writing. So if, you, if your head is spinning when you're trying to sleep, like taking down your thoughts out of your brain in a piece of paper helps. Um, and then as best as you can, trying to go to bed and wake up at the same time. Now, I confess, it's, it's a struggle because I think we're all trying to sort of stay motivated and keep going, um, but being gentle with yourself and approximate. So that's what I've been focusing on. Um, and, I, and lastly, I think it's important for us to not try to do everything, right? And so figuring out what it is your coping strategy, and then most importantly, to doing it often. And so not too many things. Great, thank you. Um, I'm going to pitch that same question to Ellen as well, actually. I, I suspect uh, your happiness program might have had, might have gone into detail around those uh, coping strategies? And if so, would you mind sharing them with us? Yeah, um, so I think for us, um, it's definitely about staying connected as a team, which has helped us um, through the stresses of the pandemic. Um, so we still have our regular meetings, but also these little extra things that we do. Um, also, I fully um, agree with Daphne, um, productivity cannot maintain the same as expected. And um, I think in a previous webinar, we also heard about like um, setting your up self for like um, small tasks that you can complete. And I think we add that to that a little bit too, by basically celebrating everything that we do accomplish under these conditions, right? So we talk about celebrating, submitting a paper. I mean, we're not there yet. We haven't published it yet, but it's an accomplishment. We finalized the paper. So we celebrate and we kind of mark that moment. And I think by having these kind of moments to live up to, that really helps us cope. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. Those are, yeah, those are two excellent answers for that question. Um, I, I've got a, a follow-up with that, which is around uh, the idea of leaning on others. So I think a lot of people you know, recommended this idea of, of you know, sharing your, your mental state with, with your colleagues and, and talking about mental health and, and, as Daphne said, sort of normalizing that discussion. Um, but I, I know a lot of people worry about, about sharing those kind of details about their mental state with their, their colleagues uh, who might feel uncomfortable sort of sharing that stuff. And it feels it may, maybe it's unprofessional in some way. Um, and I, I wonder if you had any sort of message for anyone who might think that, um, you know, what, what would you say to someone who feels that sharing their mental health might be an unprofessional thing to do or any advice for, for someone who might think that? Thank you. I was about to say, Ellen, you, by the way, for now, and I might go to Daphne afterwards. Okay. So, well, I think, I mean, we are above all people, right? We are researchers, we are employees, but we're also people. And there's a lot more going on in our lives than just what we do at work. And I think we just need to um, recognize that. And I guess for us, I mean, we kind of signed up on this happiness program. We decided as a team on a yearly retreat that we were going to do this. So for us now, it also is kind of part of our normal um, lab culture, I would say. So for us, it feels now natural to share these things. And again, you don't have to go into detail while you are um, a certain happiness level or mental state, but at least being aware of it, I think is really helpful and helps us to look out for each other. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, Daphne, um, Ella mentioned culture there, and I, I think a lot of the time when we talk about uh, mental health, I, I think there's a lot of evidence suggests that academia had issues when it came to mental health long before coronavirus happened. Um, you know, scientists are, are stressed um, generally. You know, there's a lot of, lots of evidence out there to suggest that. And I wondered if you had any thoughts around around that, around the sort of culture of academia and what maybe this pandemic 
reveals about the way researchers work and how we how we think about mental health that's a really broad question so i'll, I'll let you answer uh, it however you like so i'm first going to say that i'm actually having a lot of trouble hearing everybody so i don't really hear all your questions um so from what i hear or what i heard you're asking about first talking to people in your circle because of the professional setting versus unprofessional and also um i don't think i got the rest of it because you are cutting out so you're talking about the culture of academia as well that's right yeah i was asking after the culture of academia so okay. um okay yeah okay so i'm a trainee right now and i find that one of the biggest issues is definitely the culture and this has been going on for a very long time is systemic and trying to normalize that culture as an individual especially one who's like right at the beginning of a career is actually very hard so what i've been doing is basically using social media to try and normalize that and connecting with people who i feel uh, of the like the same wavelength and social media tends to break down that barrier that um that hierarchical barrier so we are able to talk to people across many different uh, fields across many different um stages of the career and i found that it's been very very helpful but i also do recognize that the ability to talk um is a form of privilege because if you have uh you are facing a lot of kind of isms racism uh for example you're going to find it more difficult because there are a lot of barriers against you um and for that i would say that there are options where it's not so called professional setting uh so of course counseling is one uh and then looking for online uh resources like that alone i don't know if it's available in other countries but we have that in canada where it's free you can talk to the counselors online but there are also a lot of um professional help that Daphne, you can get can I- Can I ask you to just name that resource again for us please? Empower me. E M P O W E R me. Empower me. Yes. Thank so you. you get yes, you get 24/7 uh, access to counselors and also a lot of um programs in universities have employee uh family programs. The issue would be do postdocs get access to it do adjunct faculty to get access to it so it's something where we first have to normalize it and for that it has to start with recognizing there's a problem which i think this pandemic has made it even more obvious and also to normalize talking about it without being judged because the culture seems to be that we are expected to produce a lot of work and emotions tend to be sidelined so i think starting with normalizing it yeah you have to start with normalizing it Thank you very much. Um I'm just going to invite our audience now. Um if you do have a question you'd like to ask us, it absolutely is not too late. Um if you go to the box that's somewhere on this webpage, uh, feel free to type into a question um and and we'll we'll try to get to it um in the course of the, the sort of next sort of 10 minutes we have left of this question and answer session. Um I've got a question for you Luana that's come in if that's all right. Um I think there's it was a question here around those with uh, pre-existing conditions when it comes to uh, functioning deficiencies and things like that. So um for example someone with ADHD is the example this individual gives. Um what what particular challenges do you think people with those kind of pre-existing conditions are facing currently? And uh, would you give any advice to to people such as those? Thank you. Luana uh, again I don't think we can hear you I think you're you might be muted on this oh, tool I do apologize thank you no problem sorry about that I was trying to unmute myself what I'm saying is having a pre-existing condition is certainly a vulnerability during a stressful time and this pandemic has gone from acute to really chronic stress 
And one of the things that our body does to respond to stress is activate our fight or flight, our emotional center of the brain, which actually makes us not able to think critically. So if you have a pre-existing condition such as ADHD, which really um, limit your ability to have executive function, you're probably struggling significantly more currently. And so my suggestion is to go to very behavior approaches. So for example, we often teach individuals with ADHD to really plan their day out and to be able to work in chunks, to be able to not focus for too long periods of time, to focus on one task at a time, to try to really be focused. So whatever you can do to activate your prefrontal cortex, your thinking brain, um, whatever technique you had before, you probably just need to practice a little more now. And if you really find yourself unable to focus, then I think it's time to really seek um, professional help here, um, because it is something that I've heard a lot from my patients that they are struggling more if they had ADHD or other conditions before. Thank you very much. Um, it seems as good as time as any to mention uh, some other resources. Um, I'm just going to give a quick shout out to go.nature.com forward slash well-being. I'll say that again, go.nature.com slash well-being. There's, um, there's a list of uh, nature content on there around uh, mental health, including articles from some of the, the speakers we've heard today. Um, but there's also in the support tab um, a, a list of external organizations that, that will be particularly helpful to you if you are struggling in your mental health. Um, I'll say that one more time, go.nature.com forward slash well-being. Um, and like I say, the support tab um, lists external organizations uh, alongside uh, nature content. Um, thank you. Uh, I think I'll mention that once more as we close the webcast, but we've still got a little while left. Uh, again, if anyone has a question, there might still just about be time to answer it. So um, please do type in your questions into the question and answer box somewhere on this web page, and we'll try to get to them. Uh, we, we've got a couple that have come in. Uh, I think so. someone's asking, this is an interesting one, around the overall impact of this pandemic. Well, you know, you, you just mentioned it's gone from an acute to a chronic stressful time. And I wondered if you, uh, Luana, I'll, I'll go to you again. What, how long do you think, do you expect this to last? How long are people going to be stressed for? And, and once this is over, whatever world we emerge into, uh, what sort of psychological uh, wounds might people take with them? I wonder if you have any thoughts around that. Thank you. So how long will last after we don't know? Um, what we know, let's aim for, for example, on the aftermath of September 11, um, 10 years out, 10% of first responders is still had clinical levels of post-traumatic stress disorder. So I think it depends a lot on if you are first responders, if you're not, if you had a vulnerability before, um, like ADC, like we talked about a minute ago. I think the important thing about this question really is what can you do now to be able to minimize the chances of having that mental health um, consequences after? And so some of the tips I gave on my um, talk today was really about getting ahead of that wave. Um, professionally, we all think that wave is coming, how large it is. Um, I think it's, on, we don't know at this point. Thanks very much. Um, we've got another question in that I think is also excellent. Um, it's, it's around noticing stress in others, how to, how to pay attention to other people and, and um, uh, looking after other people without necessarily them, them sharing everything about themselves. Uh, Ellen, do you mind if I go to, go to you first? So would, would you give any advice for how to uh, keep an eye on your colleagues, how to be supportive of your colleagues? Thank you. Well, I guess we're actively sharing, so we're doing it a little bit different, but I think also we've got to know each other very well during our happiness program. So we are aware of each other's personalities and like I said, I think certain personalities will be suffering a little bit more, for instance, with working from home. So that also helps us to keep an extra eye out on those that we think might need it more. And um, just again, speaking from our experience um, as a team, as a lab, and um, we also implemented a body system. 
And that's basically two people that kind of team up and uh, make sure they're doing okay. And for us, that is working really, really well, especially in a large group with a lot of people, a lot of international people that might also now be more disconnected from their family or at least feel that way without having perspective of traveling. So again, these are things that we as a team implemented and working really well for us. And yeah, I think Daphne maybe can speak more about the personal level um, there. So I'm also curious what she has to say. Thank you. Yeah, uh, Daphne. Yeah, how how have you been reaching out to people? If you have been, um, do you have any advice for that? Um, I've definitely been using social media a lot. As I said uh, in the previous question, it breaks down barriers in terms of hierarchy because a lot of people share stuff on social media. Um, the issue with social media, though, it's very uh, selective because not everybody has access to their social media or they're comfortable sharing. Um, I do want to plug one thing. Uh, it's not a personal one, but um, usually there are a lot of websites that you can search how to recognize the stress in others. But like um, there was already mentioned, it's difficult because you need to know the person really well and you need to do a lot of touching base uh, because now we don't have the opportunity to meet people and see the change in behavior. I do want to add though that it's very important that we recognize our limits um, and to know where our stresses are because we cannot take care of somebody else if we ourselves are stressed. And I think we have to make it okay for us to say, you know, I am i don't have the bandwidth right now to be able to help you, uh, but I recommend these resources and make it okay for people to seek that help uh, because otherwise you're going to burn out. And if you burn out, it's not going to help anybody, especially yourself. So we have to, yeah. Thank you. I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna go to a, a quick, uh, maybe counterpoint or or other thought on that. Luana, one of the when you uh, wrote an article for us, one of the things I think you mentioned is that is that helping other people can be a, a really powerful tool in uh, in looking after your mental health. And I I wondered, I, I you're, you're I saw you nodding with Daphne, and I, I just wondered how you can. How how can you look after people and make sure that you yourself are, are healthy and okay? Yeah, so what we know is that being of service to others decreases depression and increased well-being. And, and so I think the question is the balance, right? Not thinking about this as all or nothing. Um, but when you are helping others, what happens is you're activating your thinking brain, right? And so calm, you calm down. And I think if you, in my case, I'm trained to do that from a mental health perspective. But I, I think for those who are not, right, just reminding that, like, just listening is being of help, being of service. And, and that can help you and the other person and not taking on the burden or having to solve a problem. But I think um, resources is a wonderful way to help. But just sometimes just listening is what people need at times. And, and that's one last point, which I think goes to the, sort of the stigma of mental health. We've really been talking about brain health, reminding all of us that our brain is a part of our body. We exercise our physical body, but, you know, mental health, we see if we shift it to brain health, perhaps we have less stigma around it. Thank you very much. Um, that seems like an excellent point to, to come towards the, the end of this webcast. I've got, I've got one more question that I'm going to pass around to all of you, if that's all right. Um, and I, I just wondered, we, we've spoken a little bit about the culture of academia and, and how maybe this pandemic might change things. And I, I just wondered if there's anything you all personally hope that this, this, uh, this pandemic might, might force a change in. Um, that, you know, that might change in the culture of academia or, or some other thing in the research world. Um, yeah, I, I wonder if there's anything you, you hope that will, will, will be different from this. Um, Ellen, can I go to you first? I, I find myself saying that a lot today, but um, I'll um, do it one, one last sure. time. Um, is there anything that you hope I, this pandemic will change? Thank you. Yes, but it might be called out also by my personal experiences. Um, but I would like for people also to see that there's alternative career possibilities as well, even within, but also outside of academia. Because I remember when I was a PhD student and later on postdoc, you feel like you're in this set track of to starting your own lab, becoming a PI, but that's not for everyone. And I think it will be, and I saw one of these questions popping up too, right? Competition might become even fiercer due to the pandemic, funding shutting down, more difficulties getting things published. 
So I would also like to just kind of remind people that there's a lot of other opportunities too that can be very fulfilling as well. Thank you. Uh, Daphne, let's go to you next, if that's all right. Is there anything that you hope might, this pandemic might change? Um, so my answer is going to start very bleak in the sense that I think the change is going to be that people who are minorities in any way, uh, who have more care responsibilities, who have more different responsibilities, are going to lag because of this. Because the challenges that we have are not the same and neither are our resources. And from what we already see, like women are publishing a lot less now. Uh, and we're still at the very beginning of the, the pandemic, if you think about it. And the change in publishing has gone down. Um, and I fear that this is going to get worse. In fact, I'm pretty sure this is going to get worse. The thing, though, is that people are starting to recognize it because there's data now to show that the publishing, um, the productivity is changing. And I think it's very important because before we can uh, effect change, you first have to recognize this an issue. And now there is more conversation about it. So I'm a little hesitant, but also I'm kind of... Um, I'm kind of optimistic that we are going in the right direction by starting to recognize this as an issue. And this is going to be a very, very long fight, I would say, because the, because the struggles and the inequalities have been there for a very, very long time. And now it's just exacerbated and it's widening actively. And that's why in my presentation, I asked for people who do have power in some ways, because I'm a PhD student, right? I'm right at the bottom of the career uh, path to do something about it because they have the power to to make that change and I'm calling on them to to step up. Thank you very much. Um, powerful message. And uh, Luana, can we ask you finally to just give your hopes for the future? Thank you. I think my hope is that everyone take time to really examine what makes them happy in academia, what path is best for them, um, and to pursue that, to not, um, although it's hard, to not buy in into the only path. Um, as a Latina woman who's risen to associate professor at HMS, um, I, I chose my own path and, and perhaps different than my colleagues. And so I think really figure out what makes you happy in pursuing that. I think that's one way that we can all start to change the system. Thank you so much. I think that's a superb note to end on. Thank you so much to all three of our, our speakers for coming along and talking about this uh, this topic. And thank you for attending, those of you who are watching at home. Um, I'll just leave you again with uh, that link to a list of resources that might be helpful to you. I'll put into go.nature.com forward slash wellbeing. That's go.nature.com forward slash wellbeing. Um, and again, that has a list of nature resources, but also external resources um, for your mental health. So uh, thanks again to all our speakers. Thank you. And uh, we hope to see you soon. Thanks.